but I need three or four kid helpers. Zion's not here. I can always call him Zion. He's always a good one. Anybody raise hands who will be a kid helper? You going to help me? Okay. What's your name? David. David. My grandson. That's your grandson. Okay. And Rex going to help. I need you in just a little bit. I need two more. Grace. Oh, Grace, you're taller, so you get to be the big one in this one. One more works. This will be interesting. Okay. I'm going to have you guys sit in the front row. I'm going to use you in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. All right, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. That's uh, what we're going to be in. Mike, do we have a reader today? Re- Rebecca is? Okay. If Rebecca, if you can grab the mic or someone can get it to you. Um, we're going to do this like we typically to do. We're going through text. This is Acts. Most of you have been with us all the time. You can listen on the, on the Internet if you miss one. Um, but here's where we left off this story. Now, once again, when you go through story, when you go through a narrative of Scripture, it's describing things that have taken place. It'll describe who God is. It describes how the church interacts. Understand this. God doesn't do the same thing the same way all the time, okay? We'll see it in the text. James gets killed. Peter gets spared. Who can explain? But we know this. God doesn't change. The same God that we see in this text is the God that we need. And we'll see certain things about the people of God in this. You see their strengths. You see their weaknesses. We identify with many things there. That's, That's the narrative. So God doesn't always do it the same way. But we will, we will hear, see things about God that we need. And in God's sovereignty, He has prepared this text for us today. You may not like it. I may not like it. We all need it. God lined it up. So here, here's what's happened. Last week, we just finished chapter 11. So the story at this point from 11 through 15, those chapters, it's going to go back and forth between these two churches, the church in Antioch and the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem is the mother church, the original church. Everything starts from there. But now, as we saw last week, Antioch is birthed. It's the first place where, where the term Christians has been used. And this is a church, interestingly enough, that it begins because of persecution. It doesn't begin because of Peter and the apostles. It's everyday people that God spreads out of Jerusalem to fulfill the commission. He he commanded, spreads them out using persecution. They get there, and this church is planted. It becomes a racially diverse church, and that's the church that first understands this mission sending of God. So it's going to go back and forth between Antioch and Jerusalem, and where we left off is Agabus, as a prophet, he's come to the church in, in Antioch, and he said, hey, there's a famine coming. So the baby church takes an offering to send back to the mother church. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? So I, I don't know how you think about it, but, but this, this site here, Converge Community Church, was, was launched by the guys up in Sawyer. We have a relationship back and forth, and all the way through in Acts, we see the relationship of the church. It's the body of Christ together. So what we're going to see today is Herod gets introduced into chapter 12, and the story, the way Luke has constructed chapter 12, it's told around Herod, and Herod's a killer. Herod kills twice. Sorry, Grace, you're going to represent Herod in, in a moment. You will represent a bad person. Okay. The fact, never mind, I'll just leave it that way. So he, he kills twice. He kills James. He kills a whole squadron of prisoners, or of, of uh, soldiers. He intends to kill Peter, and in the end, he's gone. God, God takes, bam, that's right, David. He, God takes him. Okay, so you, David, you and Rex could be the good guys. Come on up here. Uh, Grace, bring a chair with you, okay? Our stage isn't tall enough. Is that okay? It's, it's just a visual. It's all it is. Because I, I, I want to capture what's actually taking place in one picture. So I'm going to put this up here. Can you stand on that? All right. So Grace is representing Herod. I have her sitting up here because she, Herod is the powerful one, okay? Go, can you do like the muscle thing? Yes. I like that. that that's impressive actually. So, can you do it for a little while? All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Man, your dad's gonna, you're going to kill me. Okay, so you guys, David and Rex, you represent the unpowerful ones. You're representing the church. Yeah, that's it. Bended knee works. Bended knee, that's good. That's good, David. That's good improv. Okay, so here, you can look up at Herod. Look up at Herod. Turn around. Herod right here. Grace. Look at, look at Herod, okay? Here's the powerful person. Here's the church. Okay, here's what this powerful person done. Has just taken one of your best friends, one of your leaders, and killed them. And now has another one captured. What's going to happen? What, does it, what do you think the church should do? What should they do? This is who's powerful. You're not powerful. This person has all the authority to take your life. What should you do? 
trick question. What should we do? <laughs> what do you think? Have God, help us. have God help us. You bet. So what do we do? We ask God to help us. That's what the church does. They have, they have no power over this guy. But you know what the church has? They got a mighty God. They got a mighty God. So the church prays. They appeal to a God who's sovereign over the universe, made the universe and the earth and the sea and everything in it. That's what these, the church does. And you know what happens? This guy is taken down and is killed. <laughs> As David says, they gone. <laughs> God takes care of this one because the church has no power, but they appeal to sovereign God. Thank you, guys. You know what? Thanks. Thanks for letting me do that. I know. So that's really what happens in this text, and everybody will remember that a little bit better because you let me do that with you. So thanks. All right. Rebecca, let's read it. Rebecca's going to read verses 1 through 12. It's the opening scene. We're going to walk through the whole thing. This is the Word of God. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to the four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on the sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word that you've prepared for us today. We ask God that you would, I, Lord, I pray for everybody here. I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive from you. You know what the week has been like for everyone. You're the only one who does. I pray, God, that you would do a work in us right now by your Holy Spirit through this word and that we might respond in ways that are good by faith. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through this scene by scene. There's basically three scenes. I'll note some things along the way. And then we're going to end lingering on two particular issues that I think um, we'll, we'll find in this particular text. So scene one, uh, Rebecca just read is uh, Peter, he's asleep in prison, verses 1 through 11. Uh, what, what the text tells us is James has just been martyred. Who's James? James is one of the original 12 disciples, now called apostles. Judas the only one that's been removed um, of his own. But James was actually one of the inner three. So if you remember this in the Gospels, the James and John brothers and Peter were a couple of times pulled off by Jesus out of the 12 uh, into a, a few events, just especially one of them was a, was a raising of a dead child. One of them is Jesus' transfiguration. One of them is in the Garden of Gethsemane. While all the disciples are there, they are a little bit nearer to where Jesus is. So it's not just one of the 12. It's actually one of the inner three, if you want to call it that, and he's killed. And now another one, Peter, is, is captured by Herod. Uh, the text tells us that he, intend, he laid violent hands on some who believed. His intention is to kill 
number one, James is gone, Peter's grabbed. What do you think the church is feeling right at that moment? This is, this is earth-shaking to them. What is going on? What is God doing? I mean, Stephen, okay, Stephen preached that sermon, and I mean, it was, it was right, it was good, but he like kind of had it coming. I mean, he, he was confronting them, the Sanhedrin. That that happened wasn't that big of a surprise. Now, here on the scene, capturing James, killing James. How does James get killed? God, what's going on? So we would, we would guess that the church is, is rattled in, in some kind of way. Look at verse 5. If you're using a borrowed Bible, I want you to do it. If you're using your own, I want you to grab a pen and underline verse 5. I think it's a key in here, and I want to run by it too quick. Because there's a, there's a contrast here. There's a juxtaposition. And Luke's, a, Luke's just a brilliant writer. He says, so Peter was kept in prison. But what? <laughs> but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. Peter's kept in prison. But earnest prayer was made to God by the church. That's David and Rex down here, by the way. That's what they were doing. That's what they were representing. Here's the almighty Herod. Here's what he's done. Here's what's anticipated. But there's a but. There's a something. There's a but God in this. Herod, the most powerful man in Jerusalem and Judea, is absolutely against the church. He's killed James. He intends to kill Peter. But the church prayed earnestly for Peter. Let us not move too quickly past this verse. And I want to ask you this. Who of us prays like that? Who of us prays earnestly like that? Is that, is that you? Maybe another way to ask it is, when do we pray like that? When does that happen? It tends to be a crisis, doesn't it? Why does it need to be a crisis? Now, the church is praying this way in this particular crisis. Is that good or is that bad? It's a crisis that causes them to earnestly pray. It's like, it's like a wake-up to realities that are always true. I want to suggest to you that such things are actually God's opportunity. I wish my life was lived every day in earnest prayer, don't you? Right? But I think as we, we think of this, we should note it, what they do. We should wonder about ourselves, not in a way of like spanking ourselves, but in a way of like, is that me? Lord, would you make me more like that? And where it tends to show up in our lives is when there's a crisis. And you can probably think of some in your life where that's happened. I want to suggest to you that earnest prayer is good. And sometimes God does that for that to happen. Why do I wait for that? Why do I wait for that? I want to suggest to you also, it's one of the beauties of the body of Christ. So you may not be going through a crisis. But in the body of Christ, brothers or sisters, somebody is around here. Somebody is. Coming to a place of realizing our dependence on God is a good thing, friends. And one of the difficulties of our culture is it culture is, is one of the most difficult things. We have so much material wealth. We have so much in terms of technology. It hides the realities that are actually true. It hides the brevity of life. It hides what our, our, our really dependence on God. We, we act all sufficient. It, ju it just does. We know it better than that, but this is, this is a good thing. We'll come back and ponder it again at the end. Earnest prayer. So Luke, the doctor, goes into some great detail in ter terms of how Peter was secured. And it's just interesting, the details. So it's, this isn't like a Houdini act or some illusion that takes place. But look at verse 4. He says there's actually four squads of soldiers. Luke tells us that deal. A squad would have, would be composed of four soldiers. So that's 16 soldiers. How they would guard someone is eight would be on duty, eight would be off duty. But as he, he's laying this out here, what, he, what he's describing is Peter is in what we would call a maximum security prison. He ain't getting out. Herod's just waiting till the Passover's over. And in this maximum security prison, we see that he's sleeping between two soldiers side by side. So I don't know how you are. Um, I don't prefer to sleep sitting that way. Um, when I'm sleeping next to my wonderful wife, when she gets up, I tend to hear it and wake up. I, 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 I get disturbed easily. I, I, I wake. Here they are. Side by side, you think if one of them moves, they're going to wake up? I mean, that's why they're right there. And they're not just sleeping next to each other. They are chained to each other. Chains, not ropes, chains. So like when 
ropes fall off, that's quiet. When chains come anywhere, they're not quiet. They're loud. This is you're supposed this guy's not going anywhere. Chains to two guys, easily disturbed when you're right next to them. It's chains, it's not ropes. And we see that there's a there's a, there's pairs of sentries, so they're guarding the doors around. So in verse seven, angel strikes Peter, light, whack. Right? My, my wife's funny. <clears throat> I hate mosquito season because she really wants to get mosquitoes. And if she sees one of me, she thinks it's supposed to be gotten, and she doesn't always tell me when she's going to swat me. And I'm like, it's like, oh, can you like just tell me it's there or something? You know, like, maybe it's an excuse. I should think, think about this longer, actually. But I imagine this swat by the angel being something like that. It doesn't say, hey, it's a side. But the light comes on, and like, you know, wake up. Get, get dressed. It's actually literally, you know, put, put, put a belt around you. So he you know, does what he says. The chains fall off, and he's just following the angel along. There's, leave those two guys behind, the first guys that are right outside the door of the room. He walks by that set of sentries and walks down the hallway and by the next set of sentries and they get to the final gates. That, then the gates open by themselves. The set of sentries right there opens right up. It's like the angel didn't say anything. The gates just open. He passes by them all. How does that happen? It's like something you would dream that would happen. In fact, that's what Peter thinks. <laughs> be dreaming. Now he's, he's had a vision. Remember chapter 10? He's had a vision. It's a dream until the angel leaves him and he's here on one of the streets in Jerusalem. He can breathe the air. He's alone. He's free. And I love, I love verse 11. He says, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me. There's this moment. I'll say, this is really happening. Calvin makes his observation. I'll paraphrase it. I like what, what Calvin says here. He's, he said, I mean, God could certainly have teleported Peter from jail to, to Mary's house where the church is praying. Just like he'd done, you remember, with Philip, chapter 8. Philip finishes with the Ethiopian eunuch um, chariot, baptizes the guy, and as soon as he's done, Lord takes, he disappears. And he's there in Azotus, and he starts preaching, going up the coast. He's gone. God just teleports him. That, that's what's going on. I mean, God could have done that here, but instead what God does is he performs a series of miracles step by step step in answer to the believer's prayers. And there, I think, by seeing the details, I think it's part of, I mean, Peter had, tells the church this, Luke records it this way, I think it is so that there's a greater wonder and amazement and worship in God. It's not just, look, that guy's asleep, that guy's asleep, those chains fell off, that gate, I mean, just like step by step. Scene two, church is praying. So I'll pick it up in verse 12 again, and we'll read through 19. When he, that is Peter, realized this, uh, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she didn't open the gate but ran in and reported that Peter's standing at the gate. They said to her, awesome, let him in. That is not what they say. We should, we're going to think about that. <laughs> That's what you think they'd say. Aren't they praying for Peter's release? What do they say? You're out of your mind. <laughs> but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking on the door, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. So what's happened here likely is the rest of the, the apostles are in hiding. Wait a minute, James, I thought James died. So it's a different James. So James, one of the other, inner three, dies. This is James, the, the half-brother of Jesus. You can find him in the Gospels because he's doubting Jesus at that point. Um, you'll see him in chapter 15, he actually speaks some things very strongly. He becomes a leader in the church, and he's the one who wrote the book of James. So, different James. Easy to see, in a sense, if it's in the same chapter. How could he be dead, and how is he here? It's a different James. Do we have two Bobs in this room, or two? I mean, it's like that. They all knew. Sorry. Um, tell these things to James the brothers, then he departed and went to another place. Okay, you want to get a bit of irony, look at Luke's writing in verse 19. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers, I bet, over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered 
that they should be put to death. Then he went down, that is, Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So what does Peter do? Verse 12. When he realizes that God has delivered him, he goes to find the church who's praying. Did Peter know they were gathered praying or not? Nothing tells us that he knew, but he knew where to find the church, and they're gathered praying. So let me ask you this question. What do you do in crisis? What do you do when things get shaken up? Maybe it's a small crisis. What do you do? What do you do? The church is called to prayer. Have you ever experienced that? So it's interesting. Sometimes there's a personal crisis and, and we move that way. It's interesting when it's, a, when it's a body of believers. For some of you, I've been through some times like that. We've been in times of crisis and, and, and gathered and prayed together. It, it's, it's very different than just alone. Um, actually, it's one of the reasons why we would encourage people to be part of a life group, a small group where things go on. You could share those things and there's, there's a different kind of strengthening and moving. I don't know how to explain it. When In the prayers of the people assembled, that's what's taking place. I, I remember, so I, I, get, I get a number of markers in my life where I've seen that happen and what God did. But I remember the very first time and I was nine years old. I was actually this month, so I was close to being 10. Four boys in our family. Uh, my parents were still very new believers. I'm nine. They're maybe, maybe six years old in the Lord. But man, they were, they were on fire for God. This is the 60s. Um, we were out at this um, lake with a bunch of people. They were working with this ministry that was doing ministry on college campuses. They were supporting it. And so I didn't know many of the people that were there. My, my folks knew some of them. It's a picnic. They had like boats and there's water skiing and all this. What I, what I remember being cool about it was they had, uh, this is the day when we didn't know sugar was bad for you. And um, so they had a pop machine there. And so back in those days, you, when you got a pop out of the, the machine, it was actually like a, I think it was a 16-ounce bottle. Anybody remember the long ones? Oh, they were, they were, when they were cold, that was so good. I don't know why we don't, you, know, you have to go to Mexico to get those now. And like, so I remember, and, and the other thing is, you didn't have to put any money in. Someone's house, they had one, and you could just like take one. Nine-year-old kid, that's like, I don't know what heaven's like, but that's got to be included. You know, nine-year-old kid, that's like great. So, so that, that's what they had. But I remember I'm down on the dock, and I was just with my brother yesterday at a wedding. He's not yet four, so he's three and ten months, and he's got one of those. So if you think four-year-old, how tall a four-year-old in a 16-ounce bottle, it was like half the size. It's not. But he's got it, and he's got it by the neck, and he's playing with a friend, and he's running down the grassy hill. I'm on the dock. I've told this story before. He comes to the end, and he stubs his toe on the end of the dock, and he falls on that bottle. Because I'm just about ready. I said, Joel, stop running. And his, it's split open. His intestines come out. I see it all. And... My mom's nearby. She grabs him. We are, we are way outside of Bloomington, something. And we, I, we, we, didn't, we weren't from that town. So we, she grabs him. She yells to my dad. My dad comes. Someone else jumps in the car. They're gone. So I'm nine. John's eight. James is six. And there I am. And I do not know oh, a couple of friends of my parents. I knew who they were. But here's what I remember. I remember the way the church came and gathered and prayed. I remember the color of the woman's suit who held me. I know her name. I know, she held me right here. Marilyn Anthony. And I remember them praying earnestly to God. And all of them there, profound impact in my life. Later I heard the stories of all the different series of miracles that God did along the way to spare my brother, Joel. Doesn't always happen that way, I know. But at nine years old, I experienced earnest prayer in a crisis as the church gathered, saw it. Do you have any of those in your life? Well, let me ask it this way. Everybody's story is different, okay? What do you do when there's a crisis? What do you do? And here's the problem in our culture. So everybody who's gone to church, been around the Bible, goes like, pray. I mean, somewhere in the long way. You know, that's the right answer. But what do I do? And some of us would have to confess that our very first thoughts when there's a crisis is, what do I need to do? Not, 
who think to pray. It just, it just is. I think it's one of the difficulties of our culture. So I'm going to ask you, was this crisis good or bad? What happens in the church? Is that good or bad? They are, they are drawn into earnest prayer. I want to suggest to you it's God's opportunity. It's a good thing. And I know there's many things. I don't know what's going on in your life. I know there's personal crises. I know there's relational breakings that are beyond repair. This side of, this side of heaven, you have no idea. How, there's financial difficulties. There's health things. I just want to assure you that when there is that crisis, we are called to go to our sovereign Lord. That's what he wants. I would suggest when you can do it, do it with brothers and sisters around you. That's what they do. And we have to confess that when we are more prone to action and think that way, we're actually thinking wrongly. We're thinking more like an atheist than a believer. And we know better. And he knows us. He knows us. So do not beat yourself up on it, but take this here as what we need to do. And here it is. So that's where they go. Let me, let's go through the narrative because the narrative is actually funny. So here's, here's Rhoda, the servant girl. She comes. She comes to the door. The church is praying earnestly, it says in verse 5. So if they're praying earnestly, why don't they believe it's Peter? And when she insists it's Peter, they, you're out of your mind. It's his ghost. Why did they think that? And Peter's like, guys, like, is Herod going to come up or what? I'm still locked outside. I'm not going to get caught by him again. He's outside. He just keeps knocking. Why does the church not believe what they're actually, they're praying for Peter. Certainly they're praying for something like this. Certainly. Friends, let's be strangely encouraged by these events. Be encouraged. Let me ask you this. Is it the amount of your faith that matters most so that God will hear you? I want to suggest to you, no, it is not. Let's remember Romans 8, 26. We might have it up here. But it talks about this. This verse is so encouraging to me. Because friends, right here, brothers and sisters, we got weakness. We're weak. And God knows it. We just do. I find, so not only weak, isn't it weird that the Bible would say to us that we do not know how to pray as we ought? Isn't that weird? Thank you for saying the truth. I don't. You ever come to that? Lord, I, Lord, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to pray here. And I'm weak. And there's the promise in it. That God has given us His Holy Spirit. That's true of the church. We see this throughout. It. He's given His Holy Spirit to intercede for us with groanings that are beyond our words' capacity. If you ever find there's times you don't know how to do that. But that's what God has given to us. So pray. They're praying fervently, yet it doesn't appear that they actually believe this is Peter. They don't believe that God will answer their prayers like that. So friends, do not let your weak faith stop your praying. Don't let it. Don't let your questions stop your seeking God. Don't let your doubts, your up and downness stop you from seeking the Lord and His help. He knows we're weak, right? Look, look what we're celebrating today. We're celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus here at the end of the service, okay? That's why he came, because we are weak. He knows it. We can't take care of our sin. We can't take it. We need him for every second that we breathe. So you can talk to him about anything. You can. Don't let all these, whatever the things are, stop you from coming to him. There's plenty of crises around there. Let the earnest prayer admonish you and be encouraged also by their inconsistent example which I share, don't you? Thank you, God, for your patience. Thank you, God, that your working is not based upon that I believed enough. Thank you that you s sovereignly accomplish good that I cannot imagine. You do exceedingly beyond more than I can imagine or thank, think. Thank you, God, that you're like that. So the narrative goes on. Peter tells them all that took place. He departs to another place, an undisclosed location. Probably most people think that he left Jerusalem at that time. And then we see Herod's response in verses 18 and 19 that no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. So imagine being one of those guards waking up with the chains on your wrists, but there is no Peter. I thought you had him. I, he's right. I mean, imagine. So Herod's not real happy about it. He goes for a thorough search of Peter 
throughout that prison, presumably throughout Jerusalem as well. If he got out, he's somewhere. So throughout Jerusalem, he examines the sentries. He doesn't like the answer. He gets back, how could you? And he kills them all, all 16. Now scene three. And I love that Luke's included this. It's probably um, at a little bit later time in history. But Luke now includes this scene saying, and God, God meets his justice out on Herod. So he introduces um, the powerful man who's killed James and these these four squads. The church is appealing to a sovereign Lord and God eliminates Herod. I'm going to read verses 20 to 25. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes and took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. The people were shouting, the voice of a God and not a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last contrast. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, back to Antioch, when they completed their service, bringing with them John whose other name was Mark, John in whose house this prayer meeting had gathered. It's just kind of interesting that Luke would include, in a sense, just a simple piece of history, um, actually a piece of history that Josephus, the Jewish historian, verifies about how Herod died. And he's doing so here to show Herod, Herod doesn't rule here. God does. That's why he includes that here. I mean, just saying, hey, God, God, the guy who's killing others, yeah, he met his end. He met his end. Actually, gruesome end. And verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. So in other words, the powerful Herod may kill one apostle, but he cannot stop what the Lord is doing within his church. He just can't. There's real evil that happens. God's sitting on his throne. God's purposes will not be thwarted. You don't have to worry about that. It's going to happen. Jesus is going to build his church. He said it. It's going to happen. Difficulties will come. We have a reconciler there. We can appeal to him for all kinds of things. And we live in this now and not yet. Ultimate's coming. Ultimate's coming. The last verse, uh, just an interesting um, biographical piece that John Mark, the one who witnesses the prayer meeting, the deliverance of Peter from his own house, he's the one who's taken with Saul and Barnabas as they return to their sending church in Antioch. Mark is the one who will later write the Gospel of Mark, the very first one that goes around. So we'll see him come up uh, much more. When they get back to Antioch, they're telling the story of God's deliverance. All right, I'm going to think about two things. First one, why James and not Peter? Why is James martyred and Peter's spared? Do you ever get those questions? There were things in your life like, Lord, why this, not that? Why is this one healed, this one isn't? Why? Those come up, right? So it's good to think about it a little bit. Who can explain the sovereign God? It's interesting how they pray. They they pray, clearly, when you go through Acts, and a sovereign God, they, they speak of him in all this way. Who can explain it? So those of you who are old remember this. Um, I remember 1982, there's a musician that had a prophetic voice, Keith Green. I remember 1982 when that plane crash went down. And actually, we've been, took, took our family to the orphanage that was dedicated to his two children, Bethany and Josiah, that died in that plane. I remember, I was like, God, why that one? I remember things that, ways he was using him in reforming the music industry, the prophetic word. Actually, that was the beginning of a, the launching of a significant short-term missions movement with YOM and other things. God, why that one? Remember, um, 1992, I think, 97. Um, driving back from St. Joe, I just preached at a, a sister church, North Lincoln, where the Yeskies came from. Those of you who know Matt Yeske, it's where he grew up. And um, hearing about the plane crash that happened the night before when Rich Mullins died. Well, why, why that one? He wasn't like the others. Why does God take this one and leave this one. That question sometimes paralyzes people. There's some, there's some questions. They won't be answered on this earth. I, I, don't, I don't think they will. And I'm not trying to trivialize this. I should say this. Did you say anything about this weekend? Okay. So some of you know this. If you've been around, 
So there's, there's a family that worshiped with us for many years on the other campus that, I mean, when you read in the papers, the tragedy of the four that were killed by the drunk driver in Buchanan, we know them all. I've been in the mission field with, right? Our lives are, are just like questions that are beyond. This text was prepared long before that. The question paralyzes many people. And I wonder, I think, I think there are certain questions that we, we need to simply, we need to leave them with God. The questions aren't bad. It's okay to have them. It's not suppressing them, but I, we need to submit them and surrender them to God. I, th- I think that's what's going on in Job. And it's interesting, it's, it's his friends who try to come to a determination of the why and come to conclusions of the why, and they come to some really wrong conclusions that God rebukes them. But I think there's times when there's certain questions that we just have to say, you're God, and I'm not. I don't understand. I have to leave this with you. It's hard to leave things, isn't it? But leaving isn't ignoring. When I say submitting, in other words you can use, or surrendering, or trusting, it's leaving it in God's lap who does know. There becomes a, a danger of judging God, which, which is just very, we're, we're tempted to do that. Isn't, isn't, isn't that what, what Satan introduces in the garden, that kind of thinking? That's, that's who the enemy is, introducing those thoughts and, and making them as pronounced as possible, being tripped up so we can't think any further. Why is Peter spared and not James? All we know is this, that God's purposes for Peter were not yet complete. And when Peter experiences the Lord's deliverance, he goes and tells the church, And he continues on. Let me assure you this. The conclusion of James' life was glorious. Now we should not forget that reality. This life is not ultimate. And so the Lord Lord took him first of of that group. Okay, secondly, that's the perplexing part. I want to think now about earnest prayer as a church. So I said some of this, but I want to come back a little differently. It's interesting that the church prays earnestly in verse 5, yet they can't believe he's there. That incongruency should actually encourage us in it. So I want to say some things that you know, but thinking about earnest prayer. First one, let the focus of your praying be upon the who you're praying to and not the amount of your faith. We appeal to, and I love that the apostles have, have said this so many times in their praying, The God who made the heavens, the universe, the earth, the sea, and all that's in it, all that is seen and all that's unseen. That's who we're praying to. And we can do so confidently. That's, we can. Let that be the focus. And we we get stuck on the amount of our faith. Or or is that what's going to move God if I would only believe more? And I would say there is some false teaching that, that bends that way. And I think it's destructive. Let the focus be on the who you're praying to. Secondly, prayer is a weapon in our spiritual warfare. Now, you know this, but I'm going to bring... So we did Ephesians last year, and the six we got here. And here's here's what happens. So whatever the crisis is. So there's there's relational breakings. There's there's lots of stuff that goes on. But if if we only see one level... So talk about a relational conflict. If we only see that level... Or someone is um, hurting because of a, a physical illness that's gone on, or whatever they're hurting from. And we're praying for God to comfort them. I think those are all good things. But I think there's another level that's beyond that we should be aware of. We know who our enemy is, right? And we know what he is. we're not unwise to his schemes, that he would be one that would try to taint the character of God as he did in the garden. That he would be the one that might try to plant seeds of bitterness someplace, seeds of doubt. We, we know what he's like in that. So when you're praying for people, think in those kind of terms. It, it is part of our spiritual warfare. So I'll just tell you, honestly, the last couple of days have been really hard for Cindy and me. And those of you who know the people that are gone, you, you would know why that is. I mean, really hard. So there's times when we're praying. This is interesting what happened. Um, so we had to just get out and walk. I don't know how you process all this. So there's times we're walking, and I found praying walking is, is very different than praying sitting. I don't know how to describe it, but almost praying sitting sometimes was like 
I mean, we pray sitting all the time, but, but in that, when it's, it was like stifling. So as we're walking, just trying to process stunning events, a 30-some-odd-year history, all kinds of ways things woven in, good and bad. But, but in the walking, there's times I felt like the Lord brought something to mind that you couldn't think of. And knowing multiple family members that remain. And ways that I felt like he was prompting us to pray that would be outside, not trying to figure something out. Not, I'm going to say, to you, do I know it was the Lord? No, but I'll tell you this. There's ways he was causing us to pray about the enemy, who our enemy is in these spiritual realms in different ways. And just God knows, so we can always submit our prayers to God who knows. That's a comforting thing, isn't it? We don't know how to pray, so we ought to pray. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That is, memorize that one, please. That is, that's so helpful to me. So just... But I think there's things that God was by His Holy Spirit prompting us in terms of calling out. Prayer, it, it's spiritual warfare. So when we think only in this level, this earnest prayer is more than, God, would you uphold, would you strengthen, would you heal them? There's a whole other dimension that we must see. That's who the enemy is. And we've seen this, I would use it cosmically, that's what's going on in terms of the church's growth all the time. And God keeps working. The final one is this. That fervent prayer, it's powerful. God has ordained to move in response to your prayers. He loves it. You can't explain a sovereign God, but I'm telling you, we should pray more, shouldn't we? Not less. He's ordained to move according to prayers of his people. He loves to answer his children's prayers. He loves it. Come to me like a child. He says it. All the language of Jesus is inviting us in, inviting us in. Why would I hold back? Would I ever say, like, God knows what he's going to do? Friends, can I say to you, that would actually be more like the voice of the evil one? Because we're called to pray. We're called to submit things to him. Big things, little things, all kinds of things. Talking to him all the time. Praying in the spirit. Praying continually. Talking to him all the time. That's what we want to walk into. So the last thing I just want to say to you is encourage you with this. Do you want to? Do you want to? Because throughout Acts, this, this happens. I'm like, Lord, make me like that. Make us as a people like that. Someone who prays continuously, earnestly, engaging in the spiritual realms. And let me confess when I'm held back by my wanting explanations when what I really need is to surrender and worship of you. That happens for us all. Let's pray. Father, all I know is that you gave us this word today. And all I know is that your word's alive and that you know everyone here and you know how to speak. And so, God, just do it. I pray that this seed of your word would not fall on hard ground and not be picked up by some little uh, that cares of the world, but, God, that this seed, you'd plant it in our hearts and it would grow. I pray that we'd talk around our tables, in our life groups, in our drive home, whatever it is, God. You'd take this and you would accomplish your purposes in it. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death and resurrection, which assures our prayers are heard that the way is open to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mike, is that you now? Yep.